Hi, AP Euro. Today we're gonna to talk about politics, economics, and culture in the late uh, 20th century. So really we're looking at the 1950s, the 1960s, 70s, and 80s during this lecture, and just kind of looking at the broad trends in each of these three categories. Um, we're gonna see that no matter what the category is that we're talking about, whether it be economics or politics or culture, all of the stuff in these decades is largely influenced by the United States. And that's largely because of the Cold War, which we've talked about last week. Remember the Cold War is this rivalry between the United States and the Soviet Union. And after World War II, it's those two powers that kind of rise above the others and become the dominant powers within the world. And so naturally they influence politics, culture, and economics in other parts of the world, especially in those countries that they have a heavy influence in, like in Western Europe. And so we're specifically looking at Western Europe today and kind of the, again, American influence in each of these three categories. So first starting with economics, this is a time of European affluence, prosperity. You kind of have this rise in consumerism during the 1950s and the 1960s, which shouldn't make sense. This should be kind of raising some questions in your mind because didn't we just have World War II when everything is destroyed? I mean, up until this point, all we've been talking about in terms of Western Europe is how terrible it is, right? Because of all the bombs and all of the war that's plagued this continent for so long. But again, we gotta go back to the United States to understand this. The Cold War, you see in the beginning at least, the United States is infusing all of this money into Western Europe in order to rebuild it. So actually, Europe is looking pretty good at this point. Most Western European countries have rebuilt, their jobs are back, their cars are back, their homes are back, their infrastructure is back, all because of all of that US money that's been infused through the Marshall Plan um, and the Berlin Airlift and all of those things that we talked about last week, okay? So the 1950s and the 1960s is a time of prosperity, largely, in Western Europe because of American money and American capitalism. And for that reason, with this new money, you have West Europeans who are buying um, all kinds of luxury items. They're buying cars, they're buying new appliances, clothing, music, entertainment. All of these industries are booming in Western Europe. And again, they're influenced by the United States. So we see kind of American brands starting to cross, a, you know, go across the Atlantic and move into Western Europe. McDonald's, for instance, Levi's jeans, American music, all of these things are now kind of infiltrating throughout Western European countries. Now, there's a backlash against this. There are some, especially younger Europeans, who are like, I don't wanna be an American. If I wanna be an American, I'm gonna go move to America, but I'm European, and so I wanna keep our European roots. Um, so even though you have all of these new American brands and American money, and you have the vast majority of people who are enjoying that, there is a, a minority group of Europeans, young Europeans, who are against what we call the Americanization of Europe, okay? So most people are pursuing this modern lifestyle, but not all, okay? Well, all this comes crashing down basically in the 1970s. So that characterized the 50s and the 60s. But when we get to the 70s, again, influenced by the United States, we have a downturn, okay? We call this 1970s economic period stagflation, okay? And the definition of stagflation is really easy to remember. There's a high and there's a low. So it's a time of low economic growth, but high inflation, okay? So stagflation is low economic growth, high inflation. So inflation just means that it costs more to get the stuff that you need um, or what you would usually pay for it. And this is the perfect example of this right now. I guess you could say it's toilet paper, right? Um, you usually go to the store and you pay what, like two bucks for toilet paper, but now it costs you maybe $5, right? That's an example of inflation. And so during the 1970s in Western Europe, they're going through this period, which is slowing down the economy, okay? It's ending that period of consumerism and affluence that we saw in the 50s and 60s. Now, why is this happening? Again, we gotta go back to the United States. Remember after World War I, you had the Dawes Plan where America says, oh, don't worry, I'm gonna keep this war repar reparation system running, I'm gonna give loans to Germany, but then what happens to the US? They have a Great Depression, everything is dependent on American money, and so it launches the world into a global depression. Very similarly in the 1970s, because the United States is funding so many different programs in Western Europe, when the US economy starts to stutter, it causes other economies to stutter as well. And during the 1970s, 
the United States has a lot of tension and conflict with the Middle East, specifically over oil production, okay? And so basically the Middle East, this organization called OPEC, which controls the majority of the oil over there, they decide they're not gonna sell to the United States anymore, which causes stagflation to occur first in the US, but then again, come over to Western Europe because they're so dependent on American money this entire time, okay? Um, so you have this period of stagflation over in Europe in the 1970s. How do the Europeans decide to get through it. Well, we saw in the beginning after World War II that they've already started to coming together economically through coal and steel organizations. They've already started cooperating. So this is another step in their economic cooperation, which eventually is going to lead us in the 1990s to the formation of the European Union. So this is another step towards that, which is why it's significant. In order to get through this period of stagflation, you have these countries that are joining together um, and helping again each other economically, free trade agreements, for instance. You have new countries that are joining the common market, Denmark, Iceland, Greece, Portugal, Spain. So not only do we see these countries coming together to help each other, but that union, um, that cooperation, it's expanding to other parts of Western Europe as well. So the common market is not only um, kind of becoming more complex and advanced, but it's expanding as well throughout the 1970s. Um, you also see the Europeans trying to start new industries, right? It's a period of low economic growth. So if you can start new industries, maybe you can kind of spur on economic growth from there. And so rather than investing in heavy industry, right, like iron and steel, for instance, the Europeans are moving into what we call a post-industrial society. So they are starting to invest in biotech and medicine and banking, these new information technologies um, from all the new technology that you just have in society in the 1970s and throughout the 80s. Um, and so they're moving their economy, shifting their economy away from heavy industry into, into more high-tech industries like biotech, for instance, or medicine. Now, again, there are some people that think this is great and that there's a lot of people who kind of have a backlash towards this, okay? And largely that backlash, again, is influenced by what's going on in the US. Whether we're talking about economics, politics, or culture, the United States is influencing all of these different areas. This is the 1960s and 70s. And if you know anything about the 60s and 70s in the United States, it's just crazy. You have the Vietnam War, you have all the protests that are coming out of that. You have the hippie movement, free love, environmentalism, the civil rights movement. You have all of this stuff in the 1960s and 70s in culture in the United States. And that's again, traveling across the Atlantic and coming over and influencing Western Europe. And so we see the beginnings of a counterculture movement in Western Europe throughout the 1970s and the late, the late part of the 1960s as well. Counterculture just means that they're challenging the traditional way of doing things, okay? So they saw the way their parents were doing things in the 1950s and the, in the early 60s, and they're like, we don't wanna do it that way, we're gonna do it our own way. So counterculture is a reaction to tradition and largely what the previous generation is doing. And again, there's a counterculture movement in the, in the United States. This would be like the hippie movement, for instance. Um, so that is coming over to Europe and we kind of have a mini version of that spreading throughout the West. Um, the counterculture in the West is largely kind of run by or headed up by what we call the new left, okay? There are a bunch of college students and they are, for, they are for a more socialist structure. So they want the government to help people through times of economic downturn. They look at stagflation, for instance, and say, well, the government should be helping more people. They should be giving them you know, food and helping them with housing and helping them with their, with their medical bills, with healthcare system, all of those things. So you have this growing acceptance towards socialism. Now, they don't wanna go as far as communism over in the East, right? Um, but, they're, but they're kind of rejecting pure capitalism that we see in the United States. So this new left is kind of heading up this counterculture movement. And really there are the beginnings of what we, what we see like socialist leanings in Western Europe. Um, the counterculture movement though is also kind of known for drug use. So we see like LSD, um, cocaine, methamphetamines, all of these types of drugs becoming popular in Western Europe as a way for these young college kids, the counterculture, to break free. Remember, counterculture is just, I don't want the traditional way of doing things, I want a new way of doing things. And so a lot of these, a lot of these people involved, they think that drugs is a way to kind of break free from tradition and find a new way of doing things. Not a good idea. 
Um, they also uh, love rock music. And so a lot of the, the rock and roll that the counterculture is involved in and listening to and producing, again, it's a backlash even against traditional forms of music that their parents enjoyed. Um, this would be like the Beatles, the Rolling Stones, a lot of the music that's produced by these bands, rock and roll in general, is exploring new ideas and again, kind of criticizing the older generation's way of doing things. And so you kind of have, again, in culture, this new youth movement that emerges in the 60s and 70s that's looking for a new way to do things. But they're not the only people who are looking for new ways to do things. Throughout the 70s, much like in the United States, you have all these new reform movements as well that spread across Western Europe. And they're not so much involved in counterculture, they're not that extreme, but they're looking for ways to improve on society, reform areas of society in order to make it better than what was previously done. And so we see this in feminism, we see a new environmental movement, Movement spreading and we also see a new labor movement advocating for better working conditions higher raises the new left is really involved in that in that part of the of the reform movements in the 1970s in terms of feminism um, it's more about women challenging patriarchy having more control over their bodies there's a sexual revolution that's going on more um, more rights for um, homosexuals for instance is kind of connected to this movement as well um, the, the book that you want to remember for this is called The Second Sex. It's written by a woman named Simone um, Bouvier in 1949. She's French and she's basically arguing that women have always been limited in society in some way and it's time for them to break free and be creative and bold and not live under that system of patriarchy anymore. The United States also influences the feminist movement over in Europe and so you have a book written by a woman named Betty Friedan. It's called The Feminine Mystique. It was written in the United States but it's really popular over in Europe as well. And again, she's challenging domestic life, the woman's role in child rearing, um, and again, kind of advocating for more creativity and boldness among women. The environmental, the environmental movement is headed up by um, a lady named Rachel Carson. She writes a book in 1962 called The Silent Spring, and it's basically about a day when all of the birds in the world die because of pesticides. Really, it's, it's a creepy book. Um, but it gets people thinking about their the, the human toll on the environment, right? So you have all these new cars, you have all of these new industries. What is the impact of pollution, fossil fuels, toxic waste from nuclear power plants? All of that new stuff, all that new technology of the 50s and 60s, in the 70s, they're thinking, what is the environmental toll that all of this newness is taking on the environment? And so you have the Green Party that forms and they're advocating for environmental restrictions, eliminating pollution, fossil fuels, more clean air um, initiatives, um, all in an effort to reform that aspect of society. Now, there's always a backlash, right? Always a backlash. We're going back and forth. That's what history does. And so in the 1980s, you see a backlash against these new reforms, against socialism, government involvement, with the rise of the conservative movement or the resurgence, largely, of the conservative movement throughout the 1980s. Um, and this is a this is a movement to basically cut government spending, to limit government involvement in the economy, to lower taxes, kind of going back to the way things were done in the 19th century when capitalism was first introduced back in Europe. So kind of removing government restrictions that that they've added along the way. And the best two examples of this are in Britain and in West Germany. So in Britain, you have the election of Margaret Thatcher in 1979. She's the prime minister. She's not only the first woman prime minister, which is kind of a big deal, but she's super tough. They call her the Iron Lady. She's technically what we call a neoliberal conservative. Um, and so she cuts all kinds of social welfare programs. She wants to reduce taxes. She has all of these different initiatives um, in order to, again, pull back government involvement in the economy. The other good example of, um, of conservatism in, in Western Europe is a guy named Helmut Kohl. He's the chancellor of West Germany in the early 1980s. He's very similar to Margaret Thatcher. He cuts taxes, government spending. The two of them are really good friends. Um, he's part of the Christian Democrat Party over in, in West Germany. The exception to this is France. France does not get involved in this resurgence of conservatism. They kind of carry on and actually become more socialist, enact more government programs and government helps throughout the 1980s. So France is the exception to this trend that we see in both economics and in politics throughout these decades. So 
If you have questions, as always, make sure that you reach out to me. I'd love to answer them for you. Um, and we're going to kind of be building on these ideas in the lectures that come. So this is just kind of an introduction to these categories in, uh, in these decades. But if you have questions, let me know. I hope you're washing your hands and I hope that I see you guys again soon. Bye.